The President will address you from the rostrum. He will then sit down next to me and we will take the questions as I explained beforehand. The press conference will last Every member of the media will have an opportunity to ask one question and one follow-up, and we'll take it from there until the one hour is up. Mr. President, please address them. Thank you very much. I can assure you, Kit, the length of the press conference is much longer than the length of sleep I got for the last three days. Let me, uh, first of all, acknowledge the presence of the Minister McCoy, the Chief of Staff of the Guyana Defense Force, Commissioner of Police, the National Security Advisor, Dr. Randy, advising the Officer of the President, distinguished members of the media, Good afternoon. This afternoon, I want to address two issues in the context of Ghana's development and in the context of what I would consider matters of great national importance. First of all, over the last couple of days, I've seen a number of social media posts and a level of excitement generated leading to some level of unease within the society in relation to the Venezuelan controversy of our borders. I want to assure members of the public and to ask members of the public to rely only on official releases from the government of Guyana, to rely only on official releases from the Guyana Defense Force, and official releases from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Exciting ourselves through sensational posting, some of it concocted to generate excitement, help to create an environment of uneasiness. I want to assure members of the public, every Guyanese, that the work we are doing, the tireless work we are doing over the last couple of weeks at different levels is not only bearing fruit, but has enabled us to strengthen our relationship with our partners and enable us to <clears throat> ensure <clears throat> that our partners are fully aware with every aspect of the Venezuelan controversy. At the level of the foreign ministry, there has been continuous engagement with foreign ministers in the region and outside of the region. At the level of the Ghana Defense Force, there has been an aggressive communication strategy, an aggressive partnership, visiting, exchange of information between the Guyana Defense Force, the Chief of Staff himself, and other chiefs in the region and outside of the region. And this has been going on at a rapid and continuous pace. Thirdly, at the level of the head, I have been engaging leaders and colleagues, not only in the region, but all across the world, ensuring that everyone is fully aware with the development as it relates to this controversy. So there is 
absolutely no space we are leaving in relation to the seriousness through which we are treating this matter. However, we must not allow the narrative to be complicated and made complex by the type of social posting that we're seeing. I assure the public that the commitment given to Guyana is unwavering. The commitment by our development partner is unwavering. We've also seen statements from Venezuela that they have no interest in a war. We have no interest in engaging in any conflict. Our primary focus is to ensure that this region remains a region of peace. That is why we are pursuing this matter relentlessly through diplomacy at every level. And we're engaging everyone President Lula, my CARICOM colleagues, Commonwealth, colleagues in the Middle East, we had very engaging discussions. I can assure members of the public that we are actively, we are actively, continuously ensuring domain awareness. We are consistently, and I want to commend our men and women in uniform for the work that they're doing and the type of information set that allows us to be confident in what we are doing. I believe strongly that there is No fear that should be driven in the Guyanese people or in our psyche at this moment. As your president, I'm confident that the course Guyana is taking will not only bring us success, but will ensure that our region remains a region of peace. So I would plea with members of the public to rely on the official channels of communication. We have had many instances of doctored video, video from 15 years ago, videos from some other part of Venezuela being circulated, claiming to be occurring on the borders, we have had people visiting. Only recently, we had the CDC conducting an exercise to bring disaster awareness to the population. But disaster in this context because of this situation was read to be an incoming disaster. But this was identifying areas for shelter, in the event of a natural disaster, as we normally do, we have asked the CDC to go across all of Ghana to ensure that we build out an infrastructure to support our disaster management. But this is how things can be misinterpreted. I'll be engaging members of the media very soon on a strategy of educating our population, on a strategy of public awareness, on Monday, I want us to do this. Because now, because, uh, as a result of the intensity of the awareness strategy and the education strategy, that also can be easily misinterpreted or misread. So we have a lot of plans in the upcoming weeks that will bring awareness to our population. 
about the controversy, educating the people. On the 3rd, for example, we have a series of activity, the 3rd of December. That includes sending a strong national unified message from Guyana to those participating in the referendum. As you're aware, on November 14 and 15, the International Court of Justice in Hague held hearings on Guyana's requests for provisional measures by which Guyana sought an order from the court to prevent Venezuela from taking any action. And I want the population to listen to this. We went and we sought an order from the court to prevent Venezuela from taking any action to violate Guyana's sovereignty in the Escuba region. Guyana's petition in the court was supported by parliament and all political actors and forces in our country. Its representation at the court included representative of the leader of the parliamentary opposition, Guyana's agent, his formal representative to the court, the Attorney General, and other officers from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm gratified to say that this is truly a national effort. Guyana sought the court's protection in response to Venezuela's scheduling of a referendum that threatens grave irreparable and incalculable harm to our country. In the referendum, the government of Venezuela seeks the approval of the people to one, reject the arbitral award of 1899, which fixed the boundary between British Guyana and Venezuela which Venezuela recognized for more than 60 years before the court has had a chance to rule on its legal validity in the case that is currently before it. Secondly, the referendum sought to reject the jurisdiction of the court and refuse to recognize its ultimate judgment. Even though the court has twice ruled that it has jurisdiction to determine the validity of the arbitral award and the finality of the land boundary. Both times, rejecting by overwhelming majorities Venezuela jurisdictional objections, the formally annexed the Asikoba region by incorporating it into Venezuela as a new Venezuelan state, to give Venezuelan citizenship and national identity cards to the Guyanese population and to develop the territory as part of Venezuela. All of these actions are violations of the most fundamental principles of international law, enshrined in the United Nations and OS charters. All of them threaten Guyana's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence. Guyana has reached out to the international community to call attention to Venezuela's actions that are completely outside the norm of the rule of law and which present a real threat to the peace and security of the Latin America and Caribbean region. In denouncing this referendum and taking this matter to the court, Guyana enjoyed the full, principled, and unequivocal support of CARICOM, the Commonwealth, and its other friends and partners around the world. Venezuela, like any sovereign state, has the right to consult its people on matters of national importance. But what Venezuela has planned for December 3rd is no ordinary consultation. What Venezuela seeks by way of this so-called referendum is a license not only to break the law, but to crumble it to bits 
a license to violate and destroy Guyana's fundamental rights as a sovereign state. After the hearings of November 14th and 15th, Guyana is confident that the court has understood its petition and that within a short time, it will issue an order directing Venezuela not to take any of the actions for which it seeks the endorsement of its people on December 3rd. Ghana is confident that the court will order Venezuela not to take any action that violates or interferes with its right to and in the executable region during the remainder of this case, until the court has ruled on the legal validity of the 1899 arbitral award and Guyana's eternal rights to this territory. We neither expect nor need the court to stop Venezuela from holding its referendum. What we expect and need is an order from the court preventing Venezuela from carrying out any of the hostile actions that might be endorsed by that referendum or any other actions that interfere with Guyana's sovereign rights. Such orders issued by the court are binding on the parties. Under the UN Charter, all states are so solemnly bound to comply with the court's orders, which can be enforced by the UN Security Council. We expect Venezuela's compliance with whatever the court orders. We do not expect that Venezuela would put itself in outright defiance of the court or in flagrant breach of its international obligations. Guyana remains and will always remain committed to the peaceful resolution of this controversy with Venezuela, including the controversy over the validity of the 1899 arbitral award and the land boundary between our two countries. That is why Guyana, in full accordance with the 1966 Geneva Agreement and the 2018 decision of the UN Secretary General brought the controversy to the, to the International Court of Justice for a final binding and peaceful settlement in accordance with international law. Guyana renewed its call to Venezuela to honor its commitment under the Geneva Agreement to participate fully in the proceedings before the court, to plead its case on the merits to the court, and to comply with the court's final judgment, whatever it may be, as both it and Guyana are obligated to do. We remain hopeful that good sense and adherence to the rule of law will prevail in our sister republic. Now, <clears throat> many persons have asked me why, Mr. President, you don't respond directly to the Vice President of Venezuela. In some of her loud and extensive outbursts that are not in keeping with peace and brotherly and sisterly relationship. You know, I have a saying it's not necessary to match ignorance with ignorance. It is just not necessary. What is necessary at this time is for us to do everything at every level to ensure that Guyana's sovereignty and territorial integrity is kept intact. And I assure all Guyanese that we are spare, sparing no effort. And I'm confident that the work that we are doing would not only ensure this, but secure this. The second issue is that of the Saudi Arabia CARICOM Summit. I want to first of all endorse fully the sentiments established in the joint statement between Saudi Arabia 
the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and CARICOM. I must say that this summit was a tremendous success. <clears throat> and we left there feeling a sense of pride that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia understands fully the value of CARICOM as an important development and strategic partner in addressing the many challenges we face as a world. Energy, food, climate, culture, and art. And the summit has led to a series of proposed actions that will see the deepening of our relationship as CARICOM in the establishment of our collective presence in Saudi Arabia and the establishment of Saudi Arabia presence in the region. Physical presence, that is. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia made available not only all their technical and ministerial resources, but their private sector resources and financing. Setting aside $2.5 billion for the development of the region, approving a number of projects for different countries. As you know, we have a project of $150 million approved to support our housing development from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And these are funds approved at 2% financing in this market. I recall <clears throat> when I started this journey of expanding our diplomatic relationship in the Middle East, there were many political scientists offering views, and I respect their views, but as I've consistently said, result is what matters. Result is what matters. Today, in every one of our engagements, we can point to direct results. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, now helping us through a grant with the building of a new stadium that will be in Region 3. approving the road project. In all the theoretical positioning, I was told that there will be nothing in this relationship. UAE approving this special needs school with a grant of $100 million. The technical collaboration on the coding project and the list goes on. So my focus is on the results. And I believe that this is the time, not only for Guyana, but for CARICOM, to find non-traditional partners in pursuit of our development goals, in pursuit of the aspirations of our people. I'm also very pleased that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has committed to creating a special window and giving some preferences for those in the region who want to go to perform the Hajj beyond infrastructure, beyond food and energy. There were deep discussions on how we strengthen our cultural exchange, how we support the development of tourism, how we get the private sector to invest in the region and here in Guyana. 
and I'm confident that in the coming weeks, we will see tremendous energy in relation to this new strategic relationship. We are also discussing, Guyana is leading this discussion, a $25 million facility <clears throat> to accelerate food production, looking at hydrophonics facility for the entire region. We have submitted all the studies, and I am confident that before the end of this year, we can see this project advance towards implementation. The Minister of State of Saudi Arabia has also committed to attending the next Heads of Government meeting in Guyana. The summit will be biannual and we are working out the mechanism that will support the evolution of this relationship, <clears throat> including the possibility of an annual foreign ministers meeting. As we continue to expand our diplomatic, political, and economic reach, I believe that great opportunity and possibility will come our way. So, I wanted to address these two matters today and give you now the opportunity to ask any question you may want to in relation to these matters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. We will take the first question. Let me remind you your name and the organization which you represent, and then you will be allowed a follow-up question if you wish. Please ask your question. Samuel Saknandan, NCN News. Mr. President, uh, you made mention that you had engaged in discussions with foreign leaders, uh, making reference to President Lula in neighboring Brazil. But generally, how responsive has the international community been towards Guyana uh, involving the Venezuelan matter? Well, <clears throat> I responded to that. <clears throat> I would say that the international community has been overwhelmingly responsive. And you only have to look at the statement from CARICOM and the statement from the Commonwealth group of countries. And you will understand how responsive the international community has been. But outside of those statements and engaging leaders within Commonwealth, CELAC, CARICOM, have I, have, I, have had, I have had engagement with our key strategic partners. And I want to assure you that those engagement has been very fulfilling and comforting for me as head of state. I have no doubt that our international partners and friends will stand steadily and in an unwavering way beside, our, be, beside us. So I would say that the response has been overwhelmingly good. Did you have, did you have a follow-up? Uh, just to ask, uh, you said they've already been um, committed commitment, their commitment is uh, unwavering. What sort of commitment have these foreign leaders or partners given you? I'm sure you would have also heard me saying that at every level, 
at the level of the president and commander in chief, at the level of the Guyana Defense Force, and at the level of the foreign ministry, there has been engagement. And all of those engagements at every level has been gratifying. Good afternoon, Trina Williams, Guyana Chronicle, Mr. President. Um, you need to raise your voice. Good afternoon, Trina Williams, Guyana Chronicle. Mr. President, um, Guyana has taken the lead in championing, Guyana has taken the lead in championing the interests of the Caribbean region, especially in issues such as climate change, food security, and so forth. I would like to know what are some of the tangible benefits our leadership has provided in the region? Well, I think, uh, I, I would not want to uh, evaluate our leadership. Uh, but if you look and listen to leaders within the region, you would be very satisfied with the work Guyana is doing. And I want to <clears throat> also commend our technicians because they also work behind the scenes to ensure that our leadership is felt and recognized. On the issue of food security, for example, we have received three recognitions so far, international recognition and regional recognition. We have been able to mobilize resources to look at resilience, sustainability, productivity, involvement of women and young people in a food production process. That leadership has been celebrated, not only recognized, but celebrated across the region. Our position on climate change and the successes we have had as a result of pursuing the Low Carbon Development Strategy 2030, our agreement with Hess Corporation, uh, working towards uh, uh, leadership and I want to, I'm pleased to tell you that we are also co-chairing uh, the group of forested countries in the Commonwealth in providing leadership on the environment, on climate change, especially as it relates to forested countries. Guyana is co-chairing that in coming up with a joint strategy and in presenting a joint strategy to COP28. Our leadership will be on show at COP28 as Guyana will be uh, given a pavilion, we are having a pavilion, a Guyana pavilion, in which many of the leaders across the world and from important international and regional organizations will be taking part in academic, theoretical, and practical discourse on issues of climate change, the environment, the forests, at those meetings, the LCDS will be placed as a tool for development, as a development model and a strategy. So here again, our leadership is being demonstrated in a very tangible way. So what we are doing and how we are presenting this leadership has allowed us to capture the attention of varied stakeholders across the world. Do you have a follow-up? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, taking you back to COP28, I know you just briefly touched on some of the strides we've, we've been making, but I would like to ask, how have we progressed in terms of being able to access resources to achieve our goals? Well, we are, Progressing, uh, I would say, at accelerated pace to the extent that to avoid issues of overheating and to avoid having inflationary pressures with the type of expansion that is taking place, we ourselves are slowing the pace of some of what we are doing. Look at what we have been able to achieve in the Middle East in terms of access to financing. And many of this, these uh, facilities rest 
on our leadership rests on what we have presented in terms of climate change, the environment. If you look at um, every discourse, Guyana is part of this, the discourse on climate at the UN, uh, and we have received many recognition in the last three years for the work we are doing. At all the side events at the UN, Guyana is at the center of leadership uh, in relation to the environment, in relation to energy and food. And as, as I've said before, our intention is to place <coughs> Guyana on the leadership table, even in the lead position in these three issues in the world 2030 and beyond. So everything, the entire ecosystem, is built around ensuring Guyana takes this uh, place as we build our economy with our partners. Sharda Bacchus from the newsroom. Uh, Mr. President, I would just like for us to turn our attention back a little to Venezuela. Uh, do you mind saying if you plan or intend to meet with your Venezuelan counterpart, Nicolas Maduro? Look, uh, I have always said, I have consistently said, that we are responsible people. We have to be mature in our leadership. I've said that the issue before the court is not up for discussion. We have chosen the ICJ as a place where this controversy from Venezuela must be settled. The matter is properly before the court, so that matter is not up for negotiations or discussion. However, however, as a good neighbor, understanding that we live in the same region and share the same space, understanding that there are important development issues that we must address together, I have always said that I am prepared to meet on these matters and to communicate and speak on these matters, as good neighbors should do. Do you have another question? Uh, Cassie Henry, DPI. Uh, Mr. President, did the CARICOM Saudi Arabia summit discuss Palestine? And if so, could you update us on ca the CARICOM and Guyana's position on this issue? Well, let me say there has been strong condemnation from CARICOM. And we did have extensive discussions on these issues. For me, this is the first publicly televised genocide in the world. This is televised genocide. We have a very strong position on terrorism. We condemn the actions of Hamas. But what is occurring now is nothing short of being a genocide. We call on an immediate ceasefire for humanitarian aid to be able to go into Palestine. We call for a two-state solution and for all parties to return to the negotiation table so that we can achieve the two-state solution. I think our position on this as CARICOM, as Guyana, is very, very clear. Very, very clear. Mr. President, pleasant good afternoon to you. Antonio Day from Cyberviews. I just have a, a follow-up question in relation to Venezuela. As you are cognizant that the minister, um, the Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, would have made recommendations, whereas Venezuela and Guyana should try to reduce tensions. I wanted to know at the Saudi Arabia um, CARICOM summit if she was apprised of really what is happening, because from her statement, it appears as if she was saying that Guyana should um, try to come to an amicable solution when Guyana is not the victim in this case? No, uh, I want to make it extremely clear that Prime Minister Motley 
And I saw Shabral, I just saw you having a story as I was coming in here. Prime Minister Motley, Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez, and all of the CARICOM leaders have expressed their unequivocal support to Guyana. And has made it very, very clear that this matter is properly before the ICJ and must be settled at the ICJ. Prime Minister Motley has made this very, very clear. What Prime Minister Motley and uh, Pres uh, Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez spoke about was the exact question I was asked a few moments ago. Whether and there is a possibility of talks. I made it very clear, and they're aware of this, because only this morning they confirmed that this matter is properly before the ICJ, and that is where it must be settled. But in the context of the rising temperature, they believe that the doors to communication must not be shut. And that is the point that Prime Minister Motley was making. You have another question? Okay, um, my follow-up question. Against that backdrop, you said that all of the regional and international leaders are apprised of what is happening currently. Could you say offhand if the, the King of Saudi Arabia has by any chance pledged his support or allegiance in this matter? I, I would not go into the details of some of these uh, communication. What I would like to tell you is that I have appraised leaders on this issue, this controversy, and I'm very pleased with the response I've received across all my engagement. Mr. President, Danny Shabral, Damara Waves. Sir, one of the questions that is on the lips of many Guyanese is whether Guyana will be seeking military support from the United States and its other strategic partners in countering any Venezuelan military aggression. What's your response? Well, first of all, we, with the work we are doing, we believe that Venezuela would not act in a reckless way. However, if they do act in a restless, reckless way, we have already, as I said before, engaged our strategic partners. We have engaged the, the chief of staff and the senior command are continuously engaged with partners across the region, and of course, extra regionally. And we are assured, we are assured that Guyana's territorial integrity and sovereignty will not, will not see our development partners standing aside and allowing anyone to take advantage of us. Outside of that, we are also sparing no effort in ensuring that we continue to enhance and strengthen our capability because we have a responsibility to do so. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, to follow up, uh, the kind of support you're expecting from the strategic partners, will that uh, see the protection of the um, operations offshore in the Stabrook Law as well? I would not elaborate on s strategy and the depth or fullness of what, that what constitute that support. But what I would say to you, Shabral, is that I'm confident that our partners will be alongside us. Should Venezuela up wrongly to act recklessly. However, again, 
just before I came to this press conference, I saw a tweet from attributed to President Maduro. Maybe I should not quote the tweet because I have not had a chance to conform it as yet. In which the narrative and the messaging is completely different from all the other uh, narrative and messaging. Please ask the question. Thank you. Mr. President, Derwin Wills, NCN. Continuing on the point uh, regarding our engagement in the international community with Venezuela. So Ghana will take up its Security Council in two months' time. And we've been in consultations with countries on global priorities. Uh, would our sitting in this important body mean that the situation with Venezuela could be sooner introduced uh, to that forum as an agenda item since Venezuela seems to not be poised to accept the rulings of the ICJ? Well, I don't want to jump the gun. First of all, I want to say a few things. Venezuela has already participated in this matter at the ICJ. It is a misconception for us to repeat the wrong narrative that Venezuela is not participating. Venezuela did participate twice and on both occasions, the court ruled against Venezuela on the issue of jurisdiction. So you can't decide one day that you're participating, and when the decision go against you, suddenly you're not participating, or you're not accepting the jurisdiction of the court. They already accepted the jurisdiction of the court. When they participated, by asked by questioning the jurisdiction of the court, and they lost that matter before the court. So we must not forget that aspect. The second issue is that, and that is an issue for Venezuela. They have to decide how they will deal with the international community when the court rules. In any way, the court rules. We have to decide. We have already subject our, subjected ourselves to the outcome of the court. But they have international obligations in accordance with the UN Charter and the OS Charter. So when that bridge confronts us, we will see how Venezuela reacts. And just yeah. one follow-up. Follow up. Still on the Venezuela matter. Um, we're a country that's becoming more data savvy, very conscious about the things. Uh, that we put data savvy yeah. and online savvy. And we're very conscious about the things that we put online, etc. So as Commander-in-Chief, uh, is the use of social media, especially uh, by our men and women in uniform, uh, a consideration as part of our security approach since uploads to social media uh, could keep our aggressors abreast with our security capacity, including personnel, artillery, and location? Well, I don't want to get involved in strategy here. But I said earlier that you too have to be careful with what you see on social media. And, uh, and, and this is the problem. You had training exercises that were conducted three years ago on both sides, whether it's trade win exercise or some other exercise. Someone get a video of it, they upload it on social media, and then that is used to drive fear among people. That is why I've said that we will have very structured communication. Let your official news come from the channels I alluded to earlier. That is what is important. Mr. President, Julia Johnson, Prime News. I want to take you back to Venezuela, or let us stay on Venezuela. And I want to ask about... Um, the gaps in communication or communicating the messages from the um, informed source sources, the government, the GDF, to those outlying areas where we have gaps, because those are the very outlying areas that have been speaking about what is happening on the border on the other side. I want to ask how are we going to close that gap? So that's a very important question. And that is where the, the communication strategy comes in. 
the public awareness strategy and the education strategy. And I alluded earlier to the fact that this is the part of the strategy that we need to strengthen and pay a lot of attention to and a lot of focus on. So that engagement, I will be uh, having a wider stakeholder engagement that would seek to develop a broader strategy in addressing this very issue, Julia. And it is an issue that we have to address because information must be timely, it must be relevant, it must be, uh, it must be accessible, and it must uh, be continuous. I appreciate. Um, before I go to my follow-up, um, I just want to ask about the very question on the gaps because what I have been hearing from the border area is not feeding into like the social media because their people are seeing whatever is happening there and they could very well be the, the, the sources that could be used to have an informed um, engagement with the rest of the country. Because but but just, just let me say, there has been a very robust engagement between the Guyana Defense Force, those communities, and I can assure you that I, I have to know how much I, what I say. I have to, I want to assure you that the information we're receiving and the analysis is of exceptional standard. And we are continuously engaging. We have a very robust mechanism. Now, a lot of activities are seen on both sides. Mm -hmm. And that can be misread. Um, we have heard the actors in Many of the actors in, in Venezuela said that this is in relation to an anti-legal mining operations. We have been continuously assessing the type of asset that is placed. That is why I said earlier that we should be very careful of not sensationalizing this uh, issue and coming up with a wrong assum assumption and creating unease, unnecessary unease. I want to take you back, sir, to the, the apprising what you described as the key st strategic partners. And I wonder if those will, those contain or those comprise of members of the Security Council, in the, that is the UN Security Council, because you did not specify the key strategic partners. I would say that uh, we are engaging partners, and many of whom are indeed members of uh, the Security Council, uh, but I would not want to specify uh, which partner said what, or would do what, or, or to elaborate on the, the type of engagement you would all appreciate that we have to respect um, the type of relationship that is being developed and the type of commitment that is being pursued. Mr. President, not Venezuela related, but I want to ask you, can you please share your thoughts on the U.S. Uh, uh, fact-finding mission here from the U.S., a U.S. group in Guyana? Uh, I, think, uh, I think I have shared my thoughts on that earlier. Um, but let me be clear on this. And by now, members of the media, you know me. Julia, you know me now. I would tell you as it is. The, the chairperson of the fact-finding mission, and Chabral, I, I, I saw you had the article, did make contact with me when I was in the UN, did communicate with me, and I said to the chairwoman of, uh, of the, this, this mission that your, the basis of your press release is fundamentally flawed and has to be influenced by some actors who has a particular agenda. And I then proceeded to send to her every single report, the Commission of Enquiry report on the elections, the UN, uh, the EU report, the CARICOM report, the OS report, and the communication went blank. I then invited her to examine the three branches of government to examine 
our house stock allocation program. And she then told me that this is not, this seems to be like the problem they face in the United States of propaganda and mistrust. But she never corrected that press statement, which I found to be very dishonorable. Then, like an open book, the cover was blown open. They arrived here, and what we saw? We saw that their entire handling was prearranged by the opposition. They were picked up by, what's the guy's name? The lawyer. Ford. 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 For, for, Ford? Oh, Roy Still, yeah, I don't really pay attention. Roy Still Ford. They were, he's Abdul? Who? He's the Abdul lawyer. The Abdul lawyer. He's the Abdul lawyer. He was picked up by the Abdul lawyer Ford. He, and guess what? The agenda mysteriously does not take them across the country. It takes them to a few, a handful of people. Why did they go and speak to the Ethnic Relations Commission and see if any of those persons ever reported anything? But it was a op the, the cover was blown open. And then the chairwoman said to me, well, you know, it is people emailing us and we, and, 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 and we want to respond to this email. Well, imagine people emailed me and told me, or text message and called me and told me that they're paid lobbyists for Rickford Bork. And I even got a text message that they're here to campaign, and I saw social media posts for, for the same guy, man. This is a lawyer? Ford, yes. He's a member of parliament or a lawyer? He's a member of parliament. Oh, member of parliament. The, the same guy, Ford, who's a member of parliament and lawyer. They said that I saw posts, social media posts, that they're here to campaign for him against the leader of the opposition, Mr. Aubrey Norton. I hear that they're paid by different entity. But I didn't write a press release saying that people emailed me and text me and say all of these things because it's irresponsible. It is irresponsible. Everybody can write you a text message or email. You can come to and, and issue a big statement. But the cover was blown open from the time they arrived at the airport. And it's like, you know, but one thing, though, she did say to me, you know, this is exactly what happens in the U.S., all this propaganda, you know. Uh, I wonder in the U.S. Um, if this group, how this group took to the uh, election cases. I wonder if um, this report, because I did submit all the reports on the elections, the U.N. report, uh, wait, I think I have, one of the reports here, let me see. I wonder if this report or this group would examine the 2,000 CSOs who was fired by AFNU government. I wonder if this group would examine the thousands of sugar workers who were sent home. I wonder if they will examine the rigging of the elections, the attempt to rig the elections. I wonder if they will examine the same four, is Ford? Ford is not a guy who went to court and tried to uh, defend the rigging? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. The, oh, that's the guy. Now I remember him. And that's the guy who, after no confidence motion was won in the parliament, went to court to delay the holding of an election that was based on the Constitution. Uh, did, uh, uh, this thing, I don't know. Are they examining that? Are they examining the more than 200 taxes that was imposed on afro indo amerindian people in this country by the last government that we remove? Why they don't examine how much house thought was given to different categories of people in the five years? And what was given under us? What continues to be given? How much roads was built in Buxton? How much roads was built in Buxton? Go to Barakara. Let the people tell you. 
This is not magic. I saw even Starbrook News had a whole editorial. They said I'm hopeless. They said I'm hopeless. Guess why? Because I'm in the streets meeting the people, talking to the people, solving problems. Guess what this hopeless man did? After the visit in Kingston and Al Alberton, go and see. Real work. Not sleepwalking. Real work. Every single village. I want to report to list all the roads that we have done in the last three years. And list all the roads that was done in the five years. I, want, I don't want it to do much. Let it take the conclusion of the OS report. And let me tell you, I saw Linden. You want to know the truth? Who closed bauxite? Who shut down the bauxite industry? In 1992, they shut it down, the PNC. We came back. We rebuilt. We got an investor to come back and invest. We gave the subsidies. We invested in the community. They came in five years, chased the investor. They chased the investor. Hundreds of jobs lost there. Hundreds of jobs lost in Region 10. We brought the investor. They couldn't keep the investor. The call center that we built in Linden, they shut it down. More than 100 people sent, sent home in Linden. I want a report on the structure of the two cabinet. Don't go far. Go in parliament, look at the composition. I want a report on the structure of the different departments and government agencies. This nonsense got to come to an end, you know. Where every Tom, Dick, and Harry believe that they can come and evaluate us. We got to put a stop to it. We, and let me tell you how I'm putting a stop to it. I'm putting a stop to it with real work, hard work, on the ground. Bringing the people of this country together. And in 2025, the people will say what they think about the work. The people will say what they think about the work. We're working for results. I will not rest until this country is united. Every Guyanese will feel the beat of progress. I don't need any outside force to tell me that. You can't sing from both sides of your mouth. If fraudulent election is bad in any state in the US, you must condemn it here. But you got a man who was at the center of the fraud organizing your evaluation. I hear a whole set of stories. Anyhow, this is, I, uh, thank you very much. I think I've addressed this issue now. Thank you. Next question. Okay, Mr. President, Antonio Day again from Starbuck News. I just want to find out from you if the government has a contingency plan. A what? Contingency plan yes. in relation, because as much as the Venezuelan government is saying that they do not want to be engaged in war, it is most likely that they will forge ahead with a referendum on December 3rd. So I want to know if the government... No, but you listen to me. You, you listen to what I said. We then go to the court. They have the right to the referendum, but we went to prevent them from acting upon any outcome on the questions that we raised. Yes, sir, I right. understand. I respect what you said, but I just want to know because, as they say, expect the unexpected. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying if the government has a contingency plan in case Venezuela goes ahead with its referendum, that's my question. Well, 
Well, they are, the, the Venezuela, they're going ahead with the referendum. They've made it very clear. We have, we, have, we have asked the court to make certain orders, and we are very confident that based on the case we presented to the court, those orders will be made. When those orders are made, then Venezuela would be out, acting outside of the rule of international law if they go against those orders, which we are hopeful, which we are confident will be made. Now, if they proceed to act based on the outcome of the referendum, then of course we are planning for that eventuality, not eventuality, for that option also of theirs, for that action of theirs. That is why I have said that our engagement is multifaceted and it covers a wide span of possibilities. Every possibility is being analyzed and uh, strategically looked at. But I, I, I understand uh, your point. We have time for two more questions. Mr. President, I'm taking you back to Venezuela again. And I want to ask you about um, following up on what um, the young man from Stabroki just asked about. But I'm not asking about a contingency plan. The, this referendum in Venezuela seemed to have galvanized the opposition and the government as one. Like the Venezuela claim again has really um, seen the government and the opposition here speaking as one. They are likely and to be fringe elements from the, especially the Venezuelan media, even if the government does not act. And I think maybe do we have a plan for that? Yeah, that, that is also a fair analysis, uh, Julia, and that we are already seeing that playing out. Uh, if you look at, and I don't want to get in their internal uh, politics there, but you're seeing th that very scenario playing out with how statements are, are, are an, uh, analyzed, who is making statements and what they're saying. And <clears throat> many commentators say that this is a big play in Venezuela to the, the uh, present uh, electoral cycle and, and so on. But that's not our business, that is their business. We have to ensure that when French element, especially from established circles, make statements, that we also have a mechanism that is activated. And that is part of the strategy that, that I'm talking about, the holistic strategy. Now, that also comes from uh, source monitoring. And also, in the case of Venezuela, it's very important that our news is multifaceted in our language and our target audience. Because, of course, um, we have Latin America, we have uh, members of UNOSOR, CELAC, that must be engaged in this new cycle. And the possibility of them being engaged in an English-driven uh, article is less than a Spanish-driven article in one of their usual um, news outlets. So that has to be uh, addressed also to ensure that Guyana's narrative uh, is not lost from uh, their circles also. I would just want to ask the follow-up. Is there um, any concern about Venezuelan military being part of the current group of migrants here? Is that a concern for us? I would say that the possibility of that is, con is of concern to us. But we have had a fairly, and I see the Commissioner of Police and the Chief of Staff here, National Security Advisor. We have had a very robust uh, system uh, in, as far as possible, monitoring those who are entering. There can be cracks, but we are also using a lot of uh, intelligence gathering to find out and to have a constant flow of information in relation to this. But that is something that 
I know we are monitoring domain awareness, uh, you know, understanding who is coming across uh, the border, who is coming in. Um, only, I think, um, today, this morning, the, this morning, in monitoring uh, the border, uh, one person, for example, who um, was thought to be someone of interest crossed the border, and I, I think that they are, they are uh, having questioning now um, on that person. Now, what, what we have seen, when I say of interest, someone of interest, is someone who, um, for example, had a radio set, um, seems to be connected with a security company or some kind of security um, apparatus. Am I right, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Staff, Commissioner? like a community policing group. So, so the initial information is like he's part of a community policing group on the other side, uh, on the Venezuela side. So that is why I'm saying I'm very, con uh, well, I'm confident at the type of work that we are doing. Uh, and whilst there are challenges, I'm not here to say that there's, there, are no, there, there are challenges. Um, we have been deploying a lot of resources. We're investing in more resources technology and data uh, collection is important. We also have international obligation and treaties that we are signed on to. So we are trying to ensure we strike that important balance also. Mr. President, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You, you wanted, a, all right, one last, I'll, I'll take the question. Um, oh. Mr. President, what would you like to say to residents from the border regions to Venezuela who are in fear of what might happen after the December 3 referendum? I would say to residents that we are ensuring that we take all necessary steps. We are taking all actions to ensure that our territorial integrity and sovereignty is protected at all times, even after December 3rd that we are not taking anything lightly, but we are confident that uh, we will be able um, to have a situation where our uh, territory is secured and our sovereignty and territorial integrity is intact. And uh, to ensure that they too um, rely on the structured agency to have their uh, information set. And I know for sure the police and the uh, Ghana Defense Force are engaging those residents continuously, ensuring that they are reassured of our presence. The chief of staff himself and other uh, colonels and, and, and uh, senior functionaries in the Ghana Defense Force um, would have visited many times in the last three weeks. The National Security Advisor, I think, also visited. This, we have maybe, I would say, five to six briefings every day because of the speed at which we are able to generate information uh, from the borders. So I am very confident of the work we are doing. I'm very confident of the work the Guyana Defense Force is doing, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I believe that good sense will prevail. I believe that uh, the peace of this region must be important also for Venezuela, but we are not taking anything for granted, and we are putting all systems in place. Thank you. Mr. President, there are reports that some of these residents are being told to move out from their villages and come to Georgetown. What sort of assurance is from there? From who? Who is giving, telling them this? There are just reports of because of that, 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 incidents yeah. happening close by that may be out of fear. There is absolutely away. no reason to move from anywhere. There is absolutely no reason. Absolutely no reason. 
those, uh, that is a type of fear mongering that people are, are pushing on social media, but there's absolutely no reason. And uh, the Ghana Defense Force, um, they are working very steadily. And as I said before, I'm confident in the, their ability, the work that they are doing, and in the type of discussions we are having with our partners. Thank you. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the media, thank you very much.